Man, this is some bad news for HBO. So HBO just lost its CEO, this guy, Richard Plepler, who is very, very tanned. But this is coming just months after its parent company was bought by AT&T. Subscribers should brace themselves for dramatic change. This is what happens in mergers and takeovers. A corporation comes in, they buy an asset, or say a company, which becomes an asset to them, that they don't really know how to manage, you know, because they didn't make that company successful. But regardless, I don't know what it is, maybe it's ego or just authority, they come in and they just start poking and messing with things they shouldn't be messing with. And it's like, oh, stop, stop, don't do that. <laughs> You're going to break it. And oh, yep, there you go. It's broken. And AT&T has just successfully broken HBO. So I made a video about this, actually, when AT&T, after they acquired HBO, John Stanky, is it Stanky? I don't know. He made a big announcement about how HBO was going to change the way they do things. HBO wasn't going to be that boutique service that we all love, you know, just picking the best content and putting it out. Nope. They were going to have to compete with Netflix now, which meant more, 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 more hours of content, more shows. AT&T wanted it to go up against Netflix directly, which no one was happy about. And that was back in July of last year. And now Richard Plepler, the CEO of HBO is stepping down. So Richard, he joined the company back in 1992 when they were just showing movies, basically. That's all they did. And boxing. They had boxing back then. But by the end of the 90s, with his help, they just started a revolution in TV. They were the first guys to have that crazy good original programming, like Oz, Sex and the City, The Sopranos. So Richard was a big part of ushering in that golden age of television that we're living in right now. He's the reason we have Game of Thrones, which if you're excited for that new season, smash like. Let's hope they don't ruin it. So here's a great tweet from Matthew Ball, who's a really smart media analyst, talking about how amazing HBO was under Plepler. He says it's the single most most profitable network in the world. In 2017, they had 2.2 billion of operating income on 6.3 billion of revenue, which is fantastic margins. But in this new hierarchy that AT&T put into place after they acquired HBO, Richard would have to get authorization to spend above 100K, which is ridiculous for a guy who's been running HBO so successfully for so many years. And he didn't have to answer to anybody, and he shouldn't have to answer to anybody. He knows what he's doing. So at that point, HBO wouldn't be able to green light its own shows and it doesn't have its own budget. The autonomy is gone. On. And when you take away that autonomy, the company that is HBO, it's not going to be the same company. And this really sucks because me, I don't know if you guys know, but I love TV. I make so many TV references in all these videos. And not only do I love TV, but I'm a huge snob about it. I hate a lot of shows and I just like a few. So obviously my favorite network would be HBO, which is really into curation versus say Netflix, which just puts out any old show. I'll tell you the one benefit of having a YouTube channel is that no one can say anything when I'm binge watching shows. When they try to say something, I say, well, hold up. I'm a YouTube star, a YouTube mega star. I have 7,000 subscribers. I need to be watching media because I'm in the media. Of course, I have to binge watch Umbrella Academy, which by the way, it's okay. But yes, YouTube lets me rationalize to my fullest extent. Okay, let's see what the very smart Ben Thomas from Stratechery has to say about all this. So first he goes over AT&T's rationale because they must've done this for a reason, right? I mean, they're a successful company too, so they're not just gonna do something completely stupid. So the first reason is that running two distinct companies is more expensive than running one. So I didn't mention this, but it wasn't just Richard Plepler that left. David Levi, or Levy, who was the president of Turner Broadcasting, he also left his post. So both the heads of the two networks that AT&T acquired both left. Not good. So both Turner and HBO have actually been together for a long time, but they've always been thought of as two separate companies. But as soon as AT&T acquired them, well, that's not going to happen anymore. So AT&T saw a lot of non-creative functions that were needlessly duplicated. So both HBO and Turner are bracing for massive layoffs, which, okay, cost cutting, that makes sense. You do gain efficiencies from combining companies. Now, the other reason that HBO and Turner were treated as two separate companies is because they had two separate business models. So HBO has always been a direct to consumer subscription business. You know, people pay for their subscription to HBO, either through their cable provider or now there's HBO Go, where Turner was a cable company. They were making money off advertising and affiliate fees. And by the way, under Turner, you get brands like TNT, TBS, CNN, Cartoon Network, all the classic cable channels that a lot of those fall under Turner. Now that separation was based off the TV business and how it used to work, which as we all know is falling apart. Cord cutting is happening everywhere and everything is becoming a subscription model. Advertising doesn't make as much money. Anymore. 
anymore either. And even if you look at how the cable business has changed, like I said, advertising has become less lucrative. So really that has switched to a subscription model too because people have to pay for cable, but it's not direct to consumer. So those subscription fees are paid by customers via cable distributors in the form of carriage fees. You know, you buy your cable bundle and that's when you get Cartoon Network. And I keep saying Cartoon Network, but TBS is by far the most important network out of all those to me. Love TBS, very fun. You know, I have to watch my old sitcom reruns. So AT&T's rationale was that Turner is increasingly reliant on those carriage fees instead of advertising, because that doesn't make money. So that means they are more dependent on cable networks, which as I said before, everyone's cutting their cord. So cable is dying. HBO though is different. They're a direct to consumer brand. So they don't have to worry about cable as much, even though a lot of people do get HBO through their cable package, but it works differently. And then AT&T, their benefit is that they have direct access to 150 million subscribers because they're a phone company, right? They're in your pocket. So they're thinking, why not combine Time Warner's content under the HBO brand, which is already a direct to consumer brand. And then you could leverage AT&T's direct relationship with everybody and their phones. And together you could hopefully get a monster that's big enough to compete with Netflix. So this is a plan to get out of cable and to move into pure streaming. And because AT&T is so big, all they needed was the content, which is why they made the acquisition. And then they have the potential to compete with Netflix. They're already in your pocket, right? So AT&T CEO Randall Stevenson basically explained it, where he's looking to become a fully integrated media distribution center when he wants that direct relationship with the customer. He says Amazon's doing the same thing. Disney's doing the same thing by establishing the direct relationship. So he's saying if you have 130 million mobile customers who all have AT&T in their pocket and you're bringing them bandwidth as well as content, well, then you immediately get to be vertically integrated just like these other guys are. So that's AT&T's plan. Go direct to consumer streaming just like everybody else. Now that would make sense if not for the way that they're doing it by killing HBO's brand. So Ben Thompson explains this too. He was saying Stevenson or is it Stephenson? I, I don't know these damn names. But you're saying he's comparing his business model with companies that have very different business models and value chains. Sure, they're all streaming companies, kind of, but the way they're doing it is very different. So Netflix, their ultimate goal is to replace cable, with the exception of live content like sports and news. But apart from that, they want to replace everything. And that's why on Netflix, even though I complain, I understand it, that's why they have so many crappy shows, just low budget shows like Hallmark Channel type stuff. And when I click through that stuff, I'm like, why is this here? But when they're looking at it on the other side with all the stats, those shows do great for them. So Netflix isn't just trying to have premium, premium content. It wants everything for everybody because it's gonna be the new cable. So I always say this about Netflix. They're good at creating good shows, but they struggle to make great shows like HBO. Netflix's best content, their top of the line stuff on their platform, there's always something wrong with it. There's always something missing. And actually the best shows that I've seen on Netflix like Peaky Blinders or The Bodyguard, those are all BBC shows. It's not even Netflix, really. Maybe that fixes itself eventually because Netflix has so much money to spend so they could buy the best content. Maybe it doesn't, but either way, Netflix is becoming the new cable. And yeah, the content is gonna revert back to average. So it's gonna be the same thing as when it used to be when we all had cable. You'd just be flipping through the channels and just land on something that's okay. You know, it passes the time. People are doing the same thing with Netflix, except instead of flipping through channels, an algorithm does it for you. Here, watch this. Here, watch this. It's all the same stuff, just more fancy. Now, Amazon has a different model. Again, still streaming, but for a different purpose because they're trying to make must-see content. So they're trying to curate and make the best stuff and only put that on their platform because that platform is a part of the Prime membership in general, which you know comes with a whole host of other benefits like the two-day shipping, music, free books, tons of different stuff. So they're not gonna be pumping out content like Netflix. They just want some hits on their channel so that you want that Prime membership even more. They're monetizing a bundle. And then you have Disney, which is getting into streaming with Disney Plus and they have Hulu too. And they're a direct to consumer play that is focused on monetizing their own strong, strong, strong IP. But that IP just fits into other parts of the Disney machine. So Disney, out of anyone, you know, with Marvel, Star Wars, all those brands, they have the strongest IP. So their strategy is going to be different. They can monetize really well what they already have. And they also have a giant ecosystem that's way different from these other companies. They have theme parks, merchandising, this, that. So they're not going to do the same strategy as Netflix. Actually, Amazon, I would say, say is a little closer. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is Disney's corporate strategy from 1957. And this thing is just amazing. See, it's like a flow chart where in the middle they have the creative talent of studio theatrical films, but then they have a whole system working together. So they have TV, they have music, they have publications, comic strips, Disneyland, merchandise licensing, and you see everything just feeds into each other. And it's actually kind of cool because every single Mickey that you see running is holding something different that makes 
sense for where it's running. See, this is from 1957, but it's still pretty much evergreen. So you could replace like TV and some of the films with streaming, but then you still got all these other ways to monetize. So it's a huge machine. Again, that's not the same as Netflix. See, Netflix is a pure model. They are trying to monetize video content directly. But Amazon and Disney, on the other hand, they are more complicated structures that have indirect payoffs. It's not a bad thing. You know, they're still going to make money, but they're not going to scale the same way that Netflix does. So Ben Thompson is questioning whether AT&T understands exactly what they're doing because they're trying to copy a streaming model, but it's not so simple as just being a streaming model because that streaming model is different for each company based on the other things going on in their business. So he asked the question, to what extent has Stevenson internalized HBO's real competitive advantage? Because for years, it was the uniqueness of the company's business model. When you make money by people choosing to pay you explicitly, you know, that's the direct to consumer as opposed to negotiating to be part of a bundle. So when you're in that type of business, you're heavily incentivized to create shows that are unique and inspire strong reactions. It's better to be hated than ignored because the former carries with it the possibility of love. So if you're a boutique shop like HBO was, they are going to be pushing the limits. You're not just going to make run of the mill hallmark like content. You're going to make really good stuff that people are either going to love or hate. So that's what made HBO extremely attractive to creators. It's the one network where you could realize your vision completely without having to water it down for the masses. So when this guy left, Richard Plopler, yeah, that's a weird name to say, but people were not happy because this guy was not only loved by the business executives because he made so much money for them, but he was also loved by creators because he let them do what they want. That's why you got shows that push the boundaries, why you even got this golden age of television in the first place is because of HBO. Richard actually points to that inflection point being the Larry Sanders show with the late Gary Shanley. It was just such a different show that people started noticing HBO and saying, wow, they're doing something different. Mostly they're saying, wow, how is this show allowed to be on the air? But it was a groundbreaking show and it pulled other artists to the network. And I mean, that's not to say that Netflix and Amazon aren't trying to catch up to HBO as far as prestige TV goes, but their advantage over HBO is mostly their pocketbooks. Like Netflix is outspending everybody. And I was talking to my cousin, she works at uh, ESPN. She works corporate for Disney. She gets into all this stuff and she's like, yeah, sure. HBO will fall, but Netflix will take its place because money will fix it. Because I was asking her, okay, what's the new premium network going to be? So yeah, I could see that. But Ben Thompson says that this pocketbook strategy should only accentuate HBO's advantages because as long as HBO retains its tastemaker status, because that's what it has, right? It's the best of the best. You can trust any new HBO show or movie to be amazing. So as long as it keeps that exclusivity and its reputation for being the best place to create your art, then it should have a sustainable advantage in acquiring the absolute best content and plugging that into its direct to consumer business model. But of course, that's what AT&T is just sticking its finger in and just screwing up because they're trying to make HBO the brand that they're going to use to take on Netflix's wide ranging bundle directly with little appreciation for what the brand was built on, which is superior content. The danger is that AT&T ends up competing with Netflix on Netflix's terms, racing to see who can spend more. And that race is exceptionally hard to win when you start out behind. Yeah, it seems like a stupid strategy. You're going to ruin your strongest brand, HBO, trying to chase Netflix, who is already winning. They're so far ahead. And Ben brings up one more great point about HBO. They had lower content acquisition costs because they didn't have as much money to spend. So they would spend it efficiently. And you know, with less money to spend, you spend that money better, which is part of why they were a tastemaker, including Richard being at the helm, only picking the best content to show. Looks like that's all gone now though. I don't know. It sucks, but RIP to HBO. I, fu I fully expect it to suck now. At least Game of Thrones is ending this season, you know, but I don't know where I'm going to get my premium TV at. Netflix shows just, eh. Not that great, but we'll see. I mean, what do you think is going to happen to HBO? Comment down below. Let me know whether you think at and strategy is smart or not. Also, give me a recommendation for a new show to watch, something with violence. Kind of out of shows right now. And if you're struggling with your emotions right now, as I kind of am, as HBO slowly dies, be sure to check out my FOMO trading guide. It'll give you tips and tricks on how to manage your emotions, which will help you in trading the markets. I'll put a link in this video and down below. Click that link, enter your email, and I'll send it over to you for free. And if you haven't already, subscribe to this channel and hit that bell so you get a notification when our next video comes out. Publishing seven days a week, all business and market related. Come hang out with us. It's so much fun. Billions is starting up soon, so you know what that means. More Billions videos, more views for the channel. I'm excited for this season, but subscribe and don't miss out. All right, I'll see you in the next video. Stay foul out there. Bye.